will tell you a little bit about aging and rejuvenation today. And we, uh, in the lab, we developed uh, this platform where we uh, study longevity, aging, and rejuvenation. Uh, at the longevity level, we study the potential of the cells and uh, organisms to live long. It's basically omics patterns across cell types, across a large uh, panels of mammals, as well as uh, longevity interventions. This uh, results in what we call uh, signatures of longevity, which indicate, again, the potential of the organism or, or cell or tissue to live long. In parallel, uh, we develop um, uh, uh, studies on aging. Here, we, of course, we need to quantify the progression through aging. And for this, we develop uh, epigenetic clocks, uh, clocks at a single cell level, as well as kind of low post clocks. This results in actionable biomarkers of aging. Uh, and the third pillar here is uh, rejuvenation where we uh, try to understand what does it mean uh, to be rejuvenated because the direction from young to old is not necessarily the same as going from old to young. And uh, this results in the rejuvenation signatures. Uh, ultimately, this allows us to target aging and rejuvenation, um, identify compounds and interventions. Uh, we have a um, uh, quite sizable uh, project funded by um, uh, NIH Director's Transformative Grant uh, to identify new interventions in an unbiased way, which hopefully will be uh, uh, good for prime time uh, next year. And today I will give you a few highlights of what uh, we are working uh, here uh, in, in these areas. Uh, so first, uh, a major development in the field has been the development of uh, quantitative biomarkers of aging. This was started by Steve Horvath, and now proliferated enough that any kind of serious conference uh, for any such conference would be a major theme. So, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, these clocks have still issues, many issues. Actually, we don't know uh, what exactly uh, clocks quantify, what's the exact relationship between the genetic age, aging, for example, and biological uh, aging. Um, if we don't know the direction of um, of responses. Uh, but another uh, issue which is highlighted here is that uh, all of the previous clocks, they work at the bulk level. So we kind of assess the tissues of many cells at the same time or, or the entire organism, whereas much of the aging happens at the uh, individual cell level. So here uh, we published a paper at the, in December of last year uh, where we developed a uh, flexible, scalable probabilistic framework for each genetic age prediction at a single cell resolution. This was developed by Alex Trapp uh, with the help of uh, Chaba Kiripeshi. And uh, so, uh, and I'll just show you very briefly how it works. So here we, uh, for example, analyzed this data set with individual hepatocytes from four month old mouse and 26, 26 month old mouse. And these are individual cells. You can see that the algorithm works pretty well uh, at predicting uh, uh, the biological age, predicted biological age of individual cells in the young mouse as well as in the old mouse. This is the clock based on, on the liver, trained based on, on, on the liver data, data. And this is a multi-tissue single cell clock. Uh, also works pretty well. So and now if we extend it to uh, analyze embryonic fibroblast, you can see that mouse embryonic fibroblast, individual cells, again, they are predicted as pretty young, or almost the age about zero. So uh, the, the, the clock works uh, also at that level. So we now applied it to many, um, uh, many kind of cell models, and, and you can go to this paper and look for, for additional kind of data. But basically the model we have is that the majority of cells uh, age like this, so kind of their chronological age corresponds to epigenetic age. However, there are some cells, like certain senescent cells, for example, they, they seem to age faster. And there are some cells which age slower. We found that particular uh, stem cells, for example, behave like this. So in the end, uh, in the tissue, we have this huge heterogeneity, which is not represented by, uh, well, at least not well represented by bulk clocks. So it's important to, to expand uh, in the, at the level of single cell. Of course, not just at uh, epigenetic uh, age, but to perhaps uh, multi-omic uh, single cell level, which we're trying to do currently. The next uh, uh, topic is uh, the aging of the neck mole rat. And this organism uh, is known uh, as demographically non-aging animal. So it, it's, in fact, it's often discussed that the neck mole rats do not age. So this is the uh, mortality rate as a function of, of the age uh, uh, from these papers. And you can see that actually it does not increase in contrast to what we've seen, for example, in mice and, and humans and other organisms. So the question is actually, do these animals age? Uh, this was addressed by Chaba Kiripeshi in this paper. 
earlier this year. So first, uh, we developed uh, an epigenetic clock. So you can see that um, uh, these are the animals from very young to approximately uh, 12, 12 years old, uh, queens, breeding males, and, and just kind of non-breeders and, and so on. So you can see the clocks uh, works pretty well. Okay, this is the paper. I, I should mention that there is a, another paper, uh, Steve Horvath, actually Steve collaborated with us, but also there is a separate paper uh, in Nature Aging, which also independently kind of developed the clock. So uh, I think the data are pretty robust. So, uh, so this, to me, it, it means that actually uh, animals do age, even though mortality does not increase with age. So now we can compare the aging rates uh, of nickel rats, uh, mice and humans. Uh, for the different size. Uh, so for example, here uh, at the same scale of in the years, we compare mouse here, uh, Nick Moret and, and human uh, for the size, which, uh, clock size which decreased with age. And you can see that Nick Moret falls really in between uh, mouse and, and human in terms of the rate. And this is on, on the relative scale. So you can see that they kind of go in parallel. So it's actually consistent with the uh, 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 known lifespan, uh, maximum lifespan for, for the naked rat, for the mouse and for the human. So, and to me, it means that um, the, the mortality is actually not a good indication of, of whether an organism ages or not. So um, I think this um, brings very fundamental questions on, on the nature of aging. So if we uh, discuss uh, what is actually aging, and some people think it's increased mortality with age, or some loss of function or increased damage. Uh, and, and of course, uh, later in life, they all represent, all of these features represent aging, but at least, uh, you know, perhaps mortality is not the best uh, kind of indication of the aging. Of the agent, although it's pretty good in humans, of course, but again, so not not perfect. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next topic is that we uh, study um, mortality or aging actually already during development. Uh, in this uh, study, which is led by Anastasia uh, Shintyapina, so we uh, gave rapamycin to uh, uh, animals uh, after they were born uh, up to forty five days uh, old. Yeah, only during development. And then we didn't do anything, just follow them. So first we found that the animals are smaller. This is quantified here. In fact, when we uh, look at the um, males uh, here and females, you can see this is the control mice. They gain weight and uh, rapamycin treated mice. Again, they were treated only during this period, uh, early in life. And then we didn't do anything. And so they continue to grow, but actually they never reach the size uh, of the control animals for males and also the same for females. So when we actually followed them, we found that uh, rapamycin treated mice, they live longer, uh, so significantly longer. Uh, when we look at the males versus females, uh, males, uh, again, live longer significantly. In the case of females, there is a trend, but it's not significant. Uh, I should point out that uh, in addition to our paper, there is another paper from the lab of Luca Tiberi, who also independently uh, carried these experiments, they also found in the mouse and, and the fly that uh, animals treated during development with rapamycin, they live longer. So in our case, we also collaborated with uh, uh, Leon Peshkin's lab at Harvard uh, studying uh, Daphne. Uh, Daphne is an invertebrate, looks like this. When we treated rapamycin during development, uh, animals are smaller, which you it here, at different types of uh, in, li in life, and also they live longer. These are three different concentrations of rapamycin only during development. Um, and uh, all of the at all three concentrations, animals live longer than control animals. So it seems like the data are quite robust, and that also means that uh, aging can already be manipulated during development. That uh, we published currently under review, but you can see a preliminary version at Bioarchive. We found that uh, actually biological age, represented by uh, here by epigenetic age, uh, is is not static. It, it's not just monotonously uh, increases with age but actually it can fluctuate. And so we found that uh, using the example of, of several um, major stressors, particular major surgery like hip replacement, emergency hip replacement and COVID-19, when people go to hospital, go to ICU and then go to ventilator and finally recover uh, in case of pregnancy, as well as the parabiosis, when we look for young animals connected to the old. Uh, so we, we, in each case, we see this um, kind of transition where severe stress uh, increases their predicted biological age uh, based on epigenetic age quantification. And then when the stress is relieved, biological age goes down. 
So I think it's, it's quite significant when we consider uh, clinical trials and generally uh, consider um, uh, treatments that uh, it's possible that the uh, organisms under certain stress, um, you know, when the stress is relieved, actually their age would simply go down without any treatment. So it's very important to do uh, kind of double blind kind of uh, clinical uh, studies uh, properly in, in, yeah, based on this data. Okay, now uh, with the, the previous example of reversible changes in biological age represents rejuvenation or not, we actually interested in addition to aging, we interested in rejuvenation. So in this slide, um, aging is uh, shown in this vertical axis by flowing water, and we can build the steps which would represent kind of slowing down the aging process um, uh, through like calorie restriction or mycin and so on. But uh, we are also interested actually taking water from here and, and bringing it back. In other words, rejuvenating organism. So we already know that this is possible. And the, the best example in my mind is the example of uh, induced peripotent stem cells, when these cells are converted from an older state to an embryonic state. And typically, it's a, it's a very young state. And I think it, there's a quite good consensus currently in the field on that topic. But we have been interested in discovering additional uh, mechanisms, discovering and characterizing. And so one uh, study, uh, which is uh, also currently under review, but also you can find preliminary version by archive, where we collaborated with uh, Jim White at uh, Duke, uh, studying parabiosis. And uh, uh, in contrast to many other studies in the field, we've done a long-term parabiosis followed by separation and then a, a detailed characterization of, of mice. So here are like three months old mice and 20 month old mice. We connected for three months and then separated and then followed for various periods of time. So first we found that uh, animals live longer uh, after they are parabiosed with the young animals. So this effect is, is significant. And then uh, we quantified biological age uh, for these animals um, in various tissues uh, immediately after separation as well as, as well as two months after separation. And whether we analyze this uh, in the liver here or in the blood, <clears throat> we can see that this is the isochronic all to all and this is heterochronic, uh, old to young, you can see that uh, actually biological age is reduced here, as well as here as well. After the detachment, uh, after two months, the, the effect still, still stays there. Uh, also in the blood, in the same way, uh, the, the biological age is reduced. We observed that over time, uh, this effect diminishes. However, I think uh, once the animals are connected for three months, it's kind of a long enough connection that the animals still live longer. Uh, yeah. Although again, so the effect seems like is diminishes slightly over time. Uh, we also quantify this at the level of uh, mm, uh, uh, gene expression. So the, actually, I should point out the uh, previous work. This work is done by primarily Bohan Zain, uh, which was a, a graduate student in the lab, just just graduated. But this RNA seq uh, part uh, was done by Alex Tishkovsky. And uh, what he found is that uh, parabiosis induces changes uh, very similar, well, not very similar, at least associated with many signatures of longevity based on the transcriptome, for example, uh, calorie restriction, growth hormone deficiency, as well as various other signatures. At the same time, when we compare these changes with the aging changes, we observe the opposite. So um, the parabiosis really changes the animals towards a younger state. I think the, the data are quite remarkable. In fact, uh, it seems like this is the strongest effect we ever observed uh, when this long-term uh, treatment with parabiosis for three months or like two months uh, afterwards, animals are literally younger in my mind, very significant. Although um, uh, because of the connection, of course, uh, in addition to the blood, the, uh, all the animals have access to the young organs. So I, I cannot imagine how it can be recapitulated, for example, by single injection of blood or, or almost like anything else, but at least at the level of parabiosis, uh, it works. So next, I want to discuss a little bit on the, um, on the beginning of aging. And last year, we published this paper where we identified a new type of rejuvenation. And what we found that at the level of the zygote, which is fertilized egg uh, in mammals, the biological age, um, predicted biological age, is not zero. It, it's low, but it's not zero, just a little bit uh, above zero. And then uh, during development, it drops uh, to the, to the, at the state, which we call ground zero state, approximately here. And then it, the aging kind of begins uh, uh, here, 
uh, we primarily studied in mice, but, but also in humans a little bit. So the, the actual data looks like this. Uh, again, this was done by Chaba Kiripeshi. And um, again, so this is the zygote. You can see that multiple samples, uh, biological age is used, and then it begins to increase. Well, potential caveat with the uh, data is that uh, the, they came from different data sets. And also, this is a bulk uh, replication of various bulk clocks. All of the clocks show the same, but uh, again, so uh, we've been wondering, uh, at least wanted to expand on that. So first, we expanded this through um, a single cell uh, clock, SCH, which uh, the one I already introduced to you. This is in this paper, again, published in December of last year. We found that uh, as we go from embryonic day 4.5 to 5.9, 6.5, 7.5, at the level of individual cells uh, represented by each dot here, biological age is reduced. So sometimes people wonder, uh, maybe it simply corresponds to um, like uh, remodeling of the DNA methylon because we know that uh, during early development, uh, the methyl groups, groups are stripped from cytosines and then later remethylated. However, what we found is actually uh, at this point from 4.5 to 7.5 days, actually methylation increases. So, in fact, the patterns like this, the lowest epigenetic age seems to correspond to the highest methylation, not to the lowest. So, uh, and then we try to, uh, to expand these studies to various uh, cell types uh, during development, try to understand really the, at a more mechanistic level how exactly rejuvenation happens. So, we found that, for example, when we study epiblasts from 4.5 to 7.5, we observe rejuvenation. So, when we, when we look at primitive streak, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm, they all seem to be rejuvenated. However, if we look at the visceral endoderm and extra embryonic ectoderm, which are extra embryonic tissues, they do not seem, seem to be uh, uh, rejuvenated at, at that point. So, it seems like there is a separation in terms of the cell types, which are chronologically kind of the same age after conception, but biologically they are not. And so, um, so the, the problem here is that we, we wanted to understand further um, uh, kind of when exactly rejuvenation happens here, this embryonic rejuvenation. And the problem with mice is that um, we cannot really follow, uh, you know, uh, a large number of embryos, plus it's in utero. So we really don't observe uh, these embryos. Therefore, we extended uh, this to the frog. And the advantage of, of the frog, Xenopus levis, is that we could follow many, many embryos at once and, and kind of ex utero, just, just in a test tube. Yeah? And we followed the kind of predicted uh, epigenetic age and mortality. Of course, for the predicted epigenetic age, the problem is that there was no clock. So we had to develop a clock. And so this is uh, what we've done. Here was done by Bohan Zeng and uh, Andrei Tarkov. Uh, this is a collaboration with Leon Pershkin, who provided. Um, uh, uh, samples and, and, and helped in many other ways. And Steve Horowitz also is part of, of, of this. This is the clock uh, with MAE of 1.82 years. And this is how it works um, the kind of at adult state, but also at a embryonic uh, state. And of course, we were interested in, in applying this clock to um, embryonic tissues. So, in fact, when we um, have done it, we observed that. Um, that the biological, predicted biological age is reduced. And it seems to be reaching the minimum approximately, I don't know, maybe like 10 hours post, uh, post fertilization. So uh, we also look at uh, DNA uh, methylation entropy. It kind of follows a similar pattern, kind of reduction. And uh, so it, it does suggest that, um, that uh, like in mice, like in mammals, there seems to be a, a reju rejuvenation phase. Of course, in mice, it's, it's in a matter of days, probably seven days or maybe nine days, but here it, it, it's in hours. And, uh, but in terms of the uh, developmental stage, it seems to be the same. In fact, it seems to map to gastrulation. And in this uh, uh, kind of expansion of, the, of this work, uh, uh, I show the zero at the gastrulation, onset of gastrulation in, in terms of hours. And here, because of we had so many embryos, we followed, actually, we followed individual uh, trajectories, development trajectories of over 6,000 um, embryos and quantified also their mortality uh, after four cell stage. Uh, mortality is quite low. Actually, it's only about 2% of embryos die. Uh, but interestingly, most of them die uh, immediately after the onset of gastrulation here. 
represented by, by this peak. And by different, different colors, they present different kind of pages and trials. We've done it over the course of a year or so. So, uh, uh, so now what we could we could do we could we could uh, kind of combine all of the data and look at DNA methylation entropy, uh, average also DNA methylation and DNA methylation age, uh, and map to mortality. They all seem to point to the same developmental stage, and this is the same stage in mice as well. So. Uh, uh, again, so DNA methylation entropy decreases, uh, average methylation increases, uh, DNA methylation age uh, uh, decreases, and it corresponds to approximately maximal uh, embryonic mortality. So Lewis Wolpert once famously said, it's not birth, marriage, or death, but gastrulation, which is truly the most important time in your life. And it seems he was correct, but uh, I, I guess this also can, can apply to aging and rejuvenation. But of course, we are quite interested, particularly in this kind of rejuvenation event. We really want to understand the mechanism of it. And, and if you understand, maybe apply this to uh, adult state. So finally, I wanted to um, kind of summarize what, what I discussed with you today. First, I introduced several new clocks. Uh, for aging at the, at the level of single cell, uh, a clock for the neck morad, a clock for the frog. Uh, I also discussed uh, aging uh, already during development. We found that uh, treatment with rapamycin during development in mice uh, extends lifespan uh, and also does the same in Daphne, actually. Uh, another topic that we discussed is aging in the absence of mortality. So we found that neck morads, uh, they epigenetically age even though the mortality rate does not change with age. Uh, another topic that we discussed is reversible changes in biological age. It seems like the, the epigenetic age is not a static feature. It can fluctuate depending on the, on the conditions, in particular severe stress uh, may cause an increase in biological age, it's represented by COVID-19, major surgery, pregnancy, and parabiosis models. And finally, we discussed several aspects of rejuvenation. So we found that heterochronic parabiosis rejuvenates old mice and extends light, the lifespan. Mm, and this effect is very robust, observed at uh, multiple omics levels, even though kind of uh, diminishes over time. Uh, then uh, we also found that the lowest genetic age uh, is observed approximately around gastrulation time, and it happens in both mammals and frogs. Again, so it needs to be expanded further into other organisms and, and studied in more, de more detail, perhaps by other clocks. So, um, so far, the data seem to be consistent, but again, so it would be nice to study it further to, to really uh, validate it by other methods. So this stage uh, seems to correspond to the also highest mortality. We don't know whether this is the case in mammals, because in mammals, it's very hard to study. Again, mortality at that scale, the mortality is not that high. And uh, also, if this is all true, perhaps, uh, indeed, aging already begins at, at the stage of gastrulation. It doesn't seem to begin at the stage of conception. Initially, we have this uh, phase of, of rejuvenation, preparing uh, cells uh, for organismal life, and and and, and then uh, and then at that point, then perhaps aging aging, aging begins following the rejuvenation. So that's it. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, current my current lab, and I, I showed you the data from Bohan, Alex, Andre, and Jesse, uh, and, and also some data from Alex, Alex Trapp, Anastasia Chaba. These people already well recently left the lab for faculty positions or industry positions, but they're still part of the lab family. We have also very nice uh, collaborators on, on these projects, and, and this is our funding sources. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh,